Max Orog shows science, not fiction, and Rust ain't no contradiction. It sure won't spill your beans, so use it by all means if permitted by your jurisdiction. Hello everyone, my name is Max Ork, and this is a talk called Considering Rust for Scientific Software. And this talk is for people who are interested in Rust, or are maybe looking for an alternative language for their uh, programs or research. And we're going to be talking about the current scientific computing ecosystem, but also Rust's place in this ecosystem and, and where it can help researchers write good code. So I'm a mechanical engineering master student at the University of Ottawa and I'm working as a radiation modeling researcher. My primary tool here is actually C++, but I've been using Rust for about a year and a half. Um, I'm also a contract software developer for a company called Mevix, which is a Canadian linear accelerator manufacturer. So uh, scientific software is sort of an interesting case where you have these very strict requirements, but um, oftentimes it's written by a very small team, um, maybe even one person or, or a couple people, and they have very limited time and resources because usually they have other commitments, maybe they're professors or uh, students or researchers. And um, this is actually a, a case where correctness of the software is very important. So it's, uh, it's possible that scientific papers will be published based on the results, and it's important um, more so than in other fields that we try and make sure our programs are as bug free as possible, especially when um, sort of research is, is sort of on the line based on these results. But it's also an area where performance of programs is, is very important because if your program takes forever to run, um, it usually means that you're going to have a lot more trouble sort of iterating or maybe running a different kind of analysis. And it's usually a very good thing when your program runs quickly because, you know, that means a lot of people can do their jobs a lot quicker, uh, especially if requirements change um, and you have to redo a bunch of analysis work. So um, sort of the final thing with, with scientific software is that the developers usually have other jobs and uh, writing software might just be part of someone's job and they don't actually consider themselves to be expert software engineers. Um, so these might be people who are primarily physicists or chemists and biologists or engineers as well. And for a lot of people, programs are just a means to an end. And um, sometimes sort of good software engineering practices are thrown out the window. So sometimes compilation of a program or interpretation is the first and last unit test that it gets. And there's also this idea that if it works don't touch it, which I think is sort of a, a negative idea. And um, I think we should be able to have the ability to refactor our programs, to add new features or to improve the performance. And um, this is sort of an idea I think we need to combat, especially when we build our own software for people to use. Um, so working in the radiation field and, and sort of going to engineering school, there's the standard case study of the Therac 25 and um, and sort of the, the issues with it. So the Therac 25 was a radiation therapy device manufactured by Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, and it was part of six major accidents between 1985 and 1987. Um, and I don't want to minimize the issues with this project. So there were a, a number of, of sort of complex factors that went into the problems that the Therac 25 had. You know, there were management issues or, um, you know, project oversight issues. And uh, allegedly there was only one developer who did the entire software for this machine. Um, but also uh, investigators did find that uh, data races or concurrency bugs in the Therac 25 control software contributed to the accidents. And I think this just goes to show a little bit that software bugs do have real world consequences and Usually it's not this serious, you know, maybe we just have to rerun our, our code to do another uh, a, an analysis job. But it is the case that um, software does affect real people and um, we have to be careful to try and avoid bugs as much as possible. So um, moving on to the, the existing scientific landscape, we have um, 
Python is sort of the lingua franca or the language that everybody speaks. And I think this is a very good thing because a lot of um, new programmers, especially today, their first language is Python. And it's important that they're able to write software in a language they're comfortable with. But um, this also brings some problems because Python is actually um, usually quite slow of a language. And this is so when people need performance, they start to reach for languages like C and C++. And these are sort of the bedrock systems programming languages that support Python. And here I'm sort of skipping over a lot of other languages. So um, for things written in Fortran and Julia, I think all of these languages are very important and they definitely have their place but I'm not going to talk about them specifically here. So uh, an issue I have with the current landscape of, of sort of scientific computing is that moving from Python, which is a lot of people's first language, to something like C++, which is, um, you know, sort of a more performance-oriented, expert-level programming language, um, this should be a natural step because many popular Python libraries um, depend on C++ as sort of a back-end language, and they're actually written mostly in C++ and sort of wrapped up nicely in Python for people to use. And uh, researcher time is usually very precious, so a lot of people want to know how to speed up their code or get better performance, and um, sometimes this is actually a very difficult thing to do in Python. It's necessary to move to another language um, like C++. But Unfortunately, right now, this is a very difficult transition step. And, um, you know, there's a lot of factors going on here. And, um, you know, the two languages are very different, uh, have different goals. But um, it is a problem because, um, you know, I've definitely seen people leave projects because they don't feel they're, they're up to the task. Or maybe they just abandon their efforts and, and sort of keep using Python and... Um, I think here Rust really starts to shine as a viable alternative to C++ because you can achieve the same or very similar performance but with a kinder, sort of more gentle systems programming language explicitly designed for non-expert users. And that's what a lot of scientific software developers identify as. So I think it's sort of a very um, important use case or, or possibility for Rust as, as sort of an alternative um, back-end implementation language to achieve certain performance goals. Um, and then, of course, you know, right away there are maybe some reasons not to use Rust. So uh, given the comparative age of all the languages, Rust is relatively young. It's only five years old, or, you know, it's been five years since its 1.0 release. And Python is actually around 30 years old, and C++ is around 40. And it's likely they're going to be around for a lot longer as well. Um, Rust also has this notion of there being a bit of a learning curve associated with it. But I will say I think it's easier to get up and running and writing good code in Rust than it is in other languages. So the compiler does a really good job of guiding you away from sort of unsafe um, uh, ways of doing things and sort of more into sort of a, a correct way of doing things. and. Um, especially for beginners, I think this is very helpful. Um, so I know that, you know, the first few months of my writing C++, um, it certainly wasn't very good. And I was making all sorts of um, sort of out of bounds errors and, and other issues that just wouldn't happen in Rust. Um, another issue, of course, is that you already have a large code base written in another language. And the, the saying is that, you know, a lot of times the, the right tool for the job is the one you're already using. And I think this is definitely the case, and I don't think that people should be re rewriting their projects completely. But I would say, you know, maybe if there's a, if there's a new component, and you're sort of looking for an alternative language, I think Rust is a really good choice for this. Uh, another point might be that there's an important library that you depend on that's actually missing on the Rust side of things, and um, you know this is definitely a valid concern. Uh, Rust's ecosystem is smaller than that of Python, of course, Python's is enormous, and that of C++, just because it's younger. But um, there are ways to access uh, Python and C++ code in Rust as well. And finally, you have things like uh, concerns about a single vendor. So there really is only one viable Rust compiler right now, even though there's work ongoing to add it to uh, GCC. 
but I will say that uh, the Rust team has done a very, very good job of supporting the Rust compiler on a variety of platforms. Uh, of course, you know, the, the three major operating systems, but also a variety of other platforms. And uh, you can definitely run it on a lot of systems. So uh, for me, though, uh, Rust is exciting because it really aligns with my goals as a researcher. Um, I want to write the fastest code I can with as few bugs as possible. And I sort of want both those things at once. And it's a bit of a vague goal, but Rust here really helps me because uh, entire classes of, of bugs are eliminated compared to another sort of unsafe systems programming language. And this means I can actually focus my time on uh, developing a better algorithm or um, actually doing some other work and, and not having to worry about bugs uh, as much as I would in another language. Uh, the other thing is that it's a sort of productive modern programming language with a lot of developer conveniences, but it also has um, competitive performance to uh, languages like C and C++. And um, I think this is probably the most important point for me is that it's a language explicitly designed for non-expert users. And I think uh, other languages cater to different audiences. So um, I think in some regards, C++ um, really cares about its expert developers, and Rust does too, but it also um, spends a lot of time making sure that the language is, is sort of suitable for, for non-expert programmers, which is often the case for uh, scientific researchers who may not identify as experts. Um, and finally, um, there's built-in documentation and testing, and this is sort of an area where I don't really want to spend any time um, sort of wrangling external tools or, you know, fixing issues with them. And also having sort of an integrated package manager in Rust is a game changer because um, personally I consider um, time spent writing build system code to sort of be a necessary evil and I want to minimize as much of that as possible. So uh, Rust's sort of first class dependency management is, is really important to me and it sort of... Um, it lets me do focus my time on more important things. Um, so sort of jumping right in, um, just to some of the Rust features I find very useful for writing numerical code, um, I just wanna sort of preface this by saying that um, more than one feature, I think it's the, the sum total of these features which is important. So you can sort of get analogs to these features using different flags for C and C++, but it's it's sort of how they're all baked into the language and um, they're on by default, which is really important. So you don't need to know which special flags to pass to your compiler. These are all turned on right away. Um, so right off the bat, we have no implicit conversions between primitive types. And so at the top here, we're actually trying to divide two integers and get a floating point number out. And Rust is stopping us and saying, actually there's mis mismatched types here um, and we expected a, a floating point number, uh, F64, but we found integers. And this is a very common beginner mistake. Um, and it's nice that it's caught right away here. And, you know, having, you know, it's not the most complex bug, but having it caught and sort of uh, addressed right away is, is a big deal. Um, so this can, this can be a little bit noisy sometimes. So here we're trying to convert between a 32-bit unsigned integer and convert it into the, the platform's size of integer. And Rust is, is not happy here either because it wants us to do an explicit conversion where we try and um, we try and convert the number, but if it wouldn't fit, we, uh, we stop execution. And um, so this is you know a little bit noisy up front, but um, this also catches real bugs, especially if we're running on something like a 16-bit platform um, where this would certainly be a bug. So um, having these things sort of caught up front is really important because um, the more things that you catch at compile time, the less you have to worry about at runtime. And this is sort of a theme within Rust and it's something that the type system really helps with. So um, there's also this notion of, of very safe defaults to a lot of operations. And um, it's what sort of contributes to Rust being a memory safe language. So um, as much as possible, it's not going to let you do unsafe operations. And oftentimes the convenient thing 
or the thing that people default to is is the safe method and there are ways of you know saying you know i actually know what i'm doing here i want to do this thing specifically but for the most part safe defaults are i think a good choice um, especially for beginners so here we have an example where we have a vector with three elements and we're going to try and access the tenth element and of course this is a bug and um, sort of the natural default way of using these um, brackets to access the element is, is sort of the safe default way. And we see here that we actually get a panic, which is sort of like Rust's way of, you know, winding down the system and, and stopping everything and exiting. Um, so we have a panic and it says, you know, the, the length of this vector is three, but we tried to get the 10th element. So of course this is a bug, um, but you know, right now a lot of performance oriented developers are saying, okay, but sometimes I know that my index is correct and I don't want to pay the cost of bounds checking. And fine, okay, let's let's go ahead and do that. So uh, Rust also has these opt-in low-level control features where we can, you know, we can do the sort of the quick or maybe the performance-oriented thing, um, but we have to tell people that we're doing it. And Rust's way of doing this is using these unsafe blocks. If there's a potentially um, memory unsafe operation going on. So yeah, it's the same same sort of example. So we have a vector with three elements and we're trying to get the 10th one, but right away it's a lot noisier. So we have this unsafe block, which says, okay, something unsafe is potentially happening here. You know, it's, it's sort of um, the programmer's way of saying, okay, compiler, you know, get out of my way. I really want to do this. But um, for people reviewing your code, it's very helpful because you can right away go to the unsafe block and and sort of um, the reviewing cost or the surface area of your review is, is shrunk because um, a lot of times you just look at the unsafe blocks and see if they're okay. And here, of course, this is not okay. So we're trying to get the 10th element of a vector with only three. And of course, this is gonna give us a garbage answer um, and Rust documentation does a really good job of saying, you know, this is actually not recommended um, and use it with caution. And this is, you know, this, this unsafe block is sort of the visual equivalent of that. It's saying, you know, something potentially dangerous is happening here and just be extra careful when you're using it. Um, and having this, this opt-in low-level control is what sets Rust apart from a lot of other uh, memory-safe languages because a lot of times you really do know what you're doing. And um, Rust will say, you know, go ahead, no problem. But um, like I said, the, the unsafe block is, is sort of very helpful here because it, it reduces the, the onus on, on a code reviewer or yourself to look at where potentially dangerous things are happening. Um, and I think another, another feature of Rust that really sort of is, is good for numerical programmers especially is that floating point numbers are treated with a lot of caution. And, you know, there are entire books written on handling floating point numbers correctly. And I think this is the right choice in a lot of cases. So here we have some potentially surprising code where we're adding 0.1 to itself three times. And if that's equal to 0.3, we're going to print out, you know, got 0.3. But otherwise, we're going to print got something else. And um, so, so this is a bit of a common beginner mistake. Um, you don't really want to trust floating point numbers. And this code actually prints got something else because in the, uh, the floating point representation of 0.1 add to itself three times is slightly different than 0.3. And Rust here is, is doing a good job and warning us and saying that floating point types can't be used in patterns because this is not a very good uh, way of doing things. And there's better ways of, of achieving the same result. Um, and this, this warning in particular is actually going to be an error in later versions of the compiler. And this is, this is sort of a bug where um, it it's may not be obvious right away, but having it caught at compile time is, is a big deal. And so sometimes this can be a little bit annoying. So um, the sort of default way of sorting floating point numbers um, doesn't actually work. So if you're trying to sort this vector of floating point numbers, you'll come up with an error that says that um, there's a trait bound that's not satisfied. And um, I'm sure there's a good reason for this. And you know, generally the reason is that 
um, not a number or you know the infinity values might be tricky to have a total ordering because uh, you know the nan or not a number value is not actually equal to itself so there's all sorts of little subtleties here and of course you can sort floating point numbers in rust there's a um, you know there's this sort of standard way of doing it and it's in the rust cookbook as well um, but myself personally I do prefer you know, if I have to do a little bit more code at the source, um, and which saves me from bugs later on, this is a trade-off that I'm comfortable making and I'd like to make in my code. Um, but another thing that, that Rust does really well is actually it's quite a good prototyping language or debugging language, uh, especially given that it's also a low-level programming language. So here we have a, a custom data structure called cool data and we have um, these vectors of, of floating point numbers in it but we also you know when you're when you're writing code and prototyping you really want to print out um, the value of your your data often and, and sort of see what's going on to it you know what's happening during execution and rust does a really good job here so we can we can add this one line to our code and it says essentially um, give me a, a debug representation of my structure. And then we can call this debug method and have printed out a really nice representation of our data. And this is great for prototyping because, you know, I just want to see what's happening and I want to sort of step through my code. And um, it's a very useful thing. And I'm, I'm using this all the time. And it's a very common pattern for people to use. Um, so another thing that uh, makes writing scientific code very um, sort of uh, really helps it is that uh, integrated testing in Rust's um, package manager means that I think tests are going to be uh, much more likely to be written. So we have some sort of math expression here and we're testing it against sort of this known value and you know, without any external tools, we can write a unit test and check it right away. And, you know, this really removes a lot of the friction around testing, um, especially compared to other languages where you might need an external framework. And um, removing friction means that people are going to do it a lot more. And it's, it's sort of an easier tool to do. And I find myself writing unit tests a lot more frequently in Rust than I would in, in another language like C++, where it's a little more tricky. Uh, and I think in particular, documentation tests are really a killer feature for scientific code because a lot of scientific code, you need a lot of examples. And this is a way to make sure your examples continue to compile even if you change your code. So here we have some uh, documentation test where it's, it's sort of the same examples before, but this will actually be published as part of our documentation. And um, having this ability to write example code and but also use it as documentation is, is sort of uh, is a really big deal because you can you can really do two things at once and this will also ensure that your example code doesn't go out of date um, which can be a big deal if you're refactoring your your project so um, sort of taken together uh, rust safety guarantees and the fundamentals of the language have a large qualitative impact on what kind of code we're capable of writing um, and I'm just going to use the example of, of data races or these sort of concurrency issues in multi-threaded code. So um, in safe Rust, you are actually guaranteed an absence of these data races. And this is a simple yes or no answer. Whereas a language like C++, we go to the C++ core guidelines and the, the best that we can get from C++ today is, is this maybe. You know, maybe your code doesn't have a data race, or maybe it does. And for me, as someone who just wants to write the code, this is 10 times or an order of magnitude better than, um, or an order of magnitude worse than um, the simple yes or no answer that Rust gives us. And it's sort of a difference in what kind of code we're comfortable writing. And uh, so the thing that sets Rust apart is that software engineering best practices are built into language and core tools. And I think that choosing Rust is going to have the biggest impact on small resource constrained teams who don't identify as expert software developers. And Rust's place in scientific computing is a language with the speed and power of C++, 
but it's also a systems language explicitly designed for non-experts and it's designed to lower barriers. It's a companion and complement language to C and C++. So there's many trade-offs between these languages. I see myself using them all in the future and there's no one correct choice here, but Rust's foundational values help us to write good software. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, thank you, it was a great talk. Hello, thanks. No, Hello. thanks for all your help. Thanks for the intro. <laughs> we have a couple of questions and um, for example, here. Uh, what do you think about Cyton as a natural next step to speed up Python code? Yeah, so I think um, I think there are definitely a lot of alternatives here. Um, personally, I haven't really done a lot of, of Cython myself, um, but I think it's um, not, you know, having, having the Rust ecosystem is also a really important thing and having sort of these examples of uh, different ways to do things or, or being able to pull a lot of dependencies into your project and, and sort of experiment with them, I think is also a really important feature that Rust offers as a language. And it's sort of this, maybe a little bit of a fresh start for, for some people. Hey, good. Okay, I have another question more. Is yep. what are your favorite ways to integrate Rust with Python, if any? Yeah, so um, I've definitely played around a bit with the uh, Pi 03 project, or I think it's the Pi Oxide project. And um, so this is a really nice way you can you can do a, uh, you can integrate Rust into, into Python just by exposing it as sort of a, a Python module, or you could also use the Python code um, in Rust as well. Okay. Well, um, we don't have more time, I'm sorry, but we yeah, can continue uh, with the Q&A in the chat. If, if any have another question in the chat can answer all the questions. So it's okay, Fantastic. thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much.